So hello and welcome everybody. I am so happy to be joined today by my fellow trans transgender uh, equality task force me members, I guess co-chairs, Representative Pramila Jayapal and Representative Marie Newman. And I'm even more pleased to be joined by Virginia Tenzone, hero to many, uh, superstar to everyone, and one of my very dearest friends and constituents, our delegate Dan Danica Rome. Now, Danica is known, is known across the country as the first openly transgender rep state representative ever elected across the country, um, which is pretty remarkable. And it was right here in Virginia 10. And I got to know Danica pretty well while, while she was running. And uh, one of my favorite stories about, about going out and knocking doors for her during her campaign in 2017 was that I would go and knock on doors and people would say, oh, Danica, we love her. She's awesome. She wants to fix Route 28. <laughs> Not a single person said anything about, oh, she's the transgender candidate because she didn't <laughs> run as the transgender candidate. She ran as the transportation candidate and that's also how she's governed. So she's been an absolute rock star. Danica, I also wanna thank you because, because I think that my stock just went up with these two ladies here <laughs> when they found out that we were friends. So thank you, thank you. So, you know, when I was, uh, you know, like a lot of women, um, I was asked to run instead of taking the initiative to run. And we have data from Emerge America that actually, you know, shows that women are more likely to need to be asked before we get in. And in my case, I knew what I wanted to run on immediately, which was, you know, fix around 28, because my predecessor spent more time focused on where I went to the bathroom than I was constituents got to work. You know, it was a, just a very simple, you know, uh, you know, campaign, you know, idea in, in that regard. And I could just remember back to being in middle school in sixth grade, sitting at All Saints Catholic School in Manassas, you know, in Congressional District 10 uh, until 6.30, 7 o'clock at night, waiting for my mom to come pick me up because she was battling it out on 28 for, you know, two hours at a time. And that commute fundamentally hadn't changed. And so I ran to go do something about it. But at the same time, when the House Republican Caucus voted party line, to defeat Medicaid expansion on a 66-34 vote in 2017. That denied health insurance to now more than 4,500 people in the district I represent. And so making sure that we and actually had health care. a million in the Commonwealth, right? 555,000 people across yep. Virginia now. Mm -hmm. And when you actually look at the, the, the data, we have to recognize that constituent service includes health care. It includes civil rights. It includes transportation, includes all of this. And so I wanted to run as a constituent service Democrat to get stuff done for my lifelong home community. And I never say I'm trans, but I really care about this. I say I'm trans and I care about this. And equality is very much a part of my platform and making Virginia a more inclusive Commonwealth is very much part of my ethos. And you know, I'm proud that we passed eight of my bills to feed hungry kids. And you know that the governor signed 23 of my bills since law in total. And at the same time, we've passed three of my pro-equality bills too, um, including one that unfortunately is about to be tested for the first time um, to ban the gay and trans panic defense after we just had a brutal homicide of an LGBTQ person um, in Blacksburg on May 31st. So the fact that we got this done and that that, law, that bill will have gone into law by the time um, you know, the trial actually begins, it goes to show that our matter, our, the issues that are important to us, especially as LGBTQ people and our allies, it's not just a paper exercise of we hope we'll feel nice about this. We're talking about not letting people get away with murder. And Congressman Wexton, you were a prosecutor and you understand exactly what it means for you know to have your most vulnerable constituents, your most vulnerable people who are looking up and needing help, not having a place to turn until they actually find a friend and an ally who has a platform in a position to do something about it. And you've demonstrated that time and time again in state Senate and the US Congress. And, you know, this is why I'm really proud to, you know, not only, you know, call you my Congresswoman, but to call you my friend too. Thank you, Danica. Now, speaking of vulnerable constituents or vulnerable people, you know, trans kids are under attack as we've never seen before. I mean, they are the new, they are the new, uh, the new ones that the, the right is trying to vilify. So what have you seen happening and, and what do you think we can do to help protect and support trans kids in schools and beyond? Um, so I would say first is what we did in Virginia last year, which is we actually passed a bill directing the Virginia Department of Education to create guidelines for best practices for how to humanely treat trans kids in schools. Second thing on this is 
while all these, you know, Republican trifecta states right now are trying to figure out how to, you know, ban trans kids from playing sports, the Virginia High School League took care of this six years ago. Our policy has been on the books now from, you know, based on the VHSL, you know, it's an independent group, but their policy has been on the books now for six years. And if you want to see a way where you're not creating a competitive advantage, but you're still giving the opportunity for kids to play, look what we've done in Virginia. It's a great policy. It's been working and it's worked without complaint. And, you know, there's just no need to vilify children. And meanwhile, we're seeing these Republican trifecta states, 65 plus bills that we know of designed to attack either trans kids who want to play sports or, tra tra or a trans youth healthcare, for example. Well, why are these politicians, these small government politicians interjecting themselves between a family and their doctor? And which of these Republican politicians actually specializes in the WPATH standards of care? Probably none. In fact, I don't even think that they know what the WPATH standards of care actually are. <laughs> I do because I've actually had to been, I've transitioned for the last eight years. I get it, but I don't expect them to. But yet when you act with malicious intent, you do things that backfire. And my fear with this is that it's really, the cruelty is the point, that discrimination is the point of this. And that when you have a body count, because you have more trans kids who are self-harming, which exactly what happened in, in Arkansas, you had more kids being admitted into the hospital for self-harm after their bill started getting passed, specifically target them, then it shows that the pe the same people who call themselves pro-life really don't care when it's a trans kid who's the ones dying. I was just thinking that is so right on. I feel like the point is cruelty. And I think that most of these issues that people try to make issues, um, they, they aren't. You know, with the bathroom bills, Washington State had had policies on the books for a long time and they were perfectly fine. There was no violation. There was nothing that happened that should have made anybody worried about it, but it became an issue. So I guess I'm wondering, as you're talking to trans members across the country who are, and you know, I, I was just talking to my 24 year old about this. I mean, they really feel very, uh, uncertain about their safety in a new kind of way. I mean, just going out and they're in a very loving community in Oakland, but still, um, what do you say to, to young people in particular who are watching this over the last five to 10 years and really feeling so targeted as a community as you yourself, I'm sure have, uh, but you know, you're so powerful. I think your words would mean a lot to um, young people across the country, and particularly also if you can speak to some of the race pieces of oppression and uh, kids of color um, who are trans, uh, you know, sort of the multiple levels that they that they are facing, that would be awesome. All right, so I'm going to start this on a on a down on a down note, and then uh, I'll, I promise I'll bring it back up, and we'll uh, we'll end on something a little bit more cheerful. When I was the lead, when I was the news editor of the Montgomery County Sentinel in Maryland in 2015 and 2016, I had to cover two brutal murders of young black trans women in Montgomery County. One of whom was dragged out into a Montgomery Village alleyway and was shot in the head and shot in the crotch and left to die in front of her mother, in, next to a line of blue dumpsters. And the person who killed her said that she was being too flamboyant. That was the first. The second is. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Zeliziana's age at the time, I think she was 19. Then you had a case in Rockville of another young woman. Her name was Kiana Blakeney. And she was stabbed in a hotel room so many times that her family had to dress her body in a white gown that came down to her wrist just to preserve an open casket funeral before they cremated her according to her wishes. And seven months later, after that murder, I remember her father, Kenny Linton, calling me, crying into the phone. I miss my baby girl. I miss my baby girl. I miss my baby girl. And all I could think the following year was about how some of these politicians who discriminate, who single people out, are the same ones who would have tapped him on his shoulder and said, you man, your son without even understanding the context in which she lived her life, who he knew her to be as, his, as her father, he knew her as his daughter. 
as daddy's girl and they checked in every day. And that's what happens. When you get to the intersection of race, gender identity, and sexual orientation, in many cases, it can be an absolutely fatal cocktail. Look what just happened in DC this week, where we had we saw a trans woman getting absolutely beaten up in a laundromat for simply existing. When we see this happen, we recognize that a that if my skin tone was closer to Congresswoman Jaya Falls than my own, and I lived an hour and a half north of where I live, and I was in the city of Baltimore, my life expectancy may have been 34 years old. I'm 36. Mm -hmm. I would have expired or been at least expected to. And at that point, you're also getting to issues of classism, poverty, of educational in in inequity and in opportunity. And you start adding all this stuff together, then imagine what it's like to be an immigrant on top of it. Then imagine what it's like to have English as a second language on top of all of that. Every one of these institutional barriers means that in a society that expects you to be one way and you have to get past each and every one of those, you're behind the eight ball the whole time. And the people who are in positions of power, of positions of influence and positions of privilege well, then look back and say, how come you're not up here yet? You haven't worked hard enough. That's what it is. Well, when the whole system is designed for you to fail, that means that you're having to break a lot of barriers just to achieve normal average things that other people will take for granted. In the Constitution of Virginia, we still have the Marshall and Newman Amendment that is designed for people like me to fail because it prohibits adults from marrying the consenting a doll of their choice if that person happens to be of the same sex as them. I think of that, and I think of the fact that when you, when we actually look at intersectionality and what it really means, when we look at systemic racism, what does it really mean? And we look at Republican politicians right now and state legislators who are willing to single out and stigmatize the very people they're elected to serve and the most vulnerable people they're willing they're supposed to be serving on top of that, you are at that point telling your constituents that their mere essence is wrong and that they are going to have to spend their lives overcoming hurdles, where it should be our job as elected officials to tear those barriers down. And when we actually put people in positions to show what representation looks like, to show what's possible, that yes, we can win elections. We can unseat people who wanna take our civil rights away, so we'll take their seats away. We can show people what it's like to, and all three of you, and myself included by this, all of you have trans family members, all of you do. And I know this, you know, just based on your own personal stories, and I've seen each of you speaking at the mic passionately about your own family. And when I think about what you've been through with this, to be the advocate for your niece or for your, uh, for your child or for your daughter, it means so much to other kids who say, hey, she's standing up. She cares. There's someone in power. There's an elected official who actually cares. Maybe I can talk to them. Maybe I can get to know them. Or maybe things aren't so hopeless. Maybe I can see someone who has, has a trans pride flag outside of her office, maybe I don't know who she is, but I'm pretty sure she cares about people like me. I spent my adult life before I transitioned and then early into my transitioning, having to wonder about what civil rights I was gonna lose every year because when the Virginia General Assembly went into session. Now we are not on defense anymore. Now we're creating inclusive policies. Now I'm at a place where when the former president uh, stopped over in Jamestown, I was able to bring a young black trans woman with me as my guest and put her on cameras in front of NPR, in front of newspaper reporters to have her rebut the racist president of the United States, let alone someone who out openly advocated for transphobic policies on top of that. To give someone like her a platform to be able to speak truth to power and to have other people listen, one of the things we have to remember 
is that when we succeed, when we get into office, we need to use our platforms to empower our constituents and to empower people whose voices are not included. And bringing more black trans women to the table in this case, what better way can I use my platform as a local legislator with a national platform than to make sure that people in marginalized communities and people who need to be heard are actually being represented by themselves instead of having to count on someone else to do it. You know, you're, I just have to say one quick thing that was so incredibly beautiful, everything you said, and it reminded me that um, uh, several years ago, I got to go to the White House Christmas party and I took Marcy Owens with me, who uh, some of you may remember was standing next to President Obama when he signed the Affordable Care Act into law. Marcy transitioned um, since that time and has been such a powerful spokesperson. And I think she was, must have been, I don't know, maybe 20 at the time or 18 at the time. And I took Marcy and her grandmother, because her mother had died because she had no health coverage, um, to the White House. That's how Marcy became such a, uh, such a strong advocate for Medicare for All and universal health care um, because of what she went through and losing her mom. And it was the most amazing feeling to have her there and you know she had she had tried to walk away actually for a while from that whole piece around the Affordable Care Act because it was it was not who she was anymore and they kept flashing that picture of her um, as she looked then and you know and then she sort of she, came, she called me one day and she said you know what that is all part of me I'm only here because I was there at the time and then I'm and then I was able to find myself and my voice and it was really a beautiful thing and she's such a strong advocate for intersectionality in in uh speaking up for herself and for other black trans people that you know just makes me so proud and you reminded me of that beautiful story so just wanted to throw it in yeah i had forgotten danica about what you did for jamestown for your con for your constituent to come bring her and that's fantastic. I had totally forgotten about that. And I know that, you know, I have I've have heard from people all around the country just as an ally. So I'm sure that you hear from people all the time. And I can't tell you how much it means to them to have you have you doing your thing and being so fierce and so proud and so self-assured. I I can't say that enough too, Danica. I have watched uh, you be such a fierce advocate, and it has been very meaningful for my daughter. Um, so we're sitting here. Um, Tomorrow is the sixth anniversary of my daughter's coming out. Mm. So um, when I got the opportunity, um, and thank you, Jennifer, for um, putting this together. Um, when I got the opportunity to talk to my pals, Jennifer and Pramila, and my new pal, Danica, um, that I, I was just beaming. So I, I called Evie this morning um, and said that, you know, I'm talking, I'm going to be talking to some of the very fiercest advocates that I admire greatly in this space. And uh, she was just uh, thought that was the greatest thing. I still, um, to this day, um, it was so ironic. She came out in June, right? <laughs> I, I, I said, you're right on brand, Dolly. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, it is a wonderful thing. And once you do find your authenticity, I think that it's this weight gets lifted, right? Um, but from time to time, all of us um, as, as parents and, and uh, aunts and uncles and, and uh, for folks that we have loved ones, we put that backpack back on every day. And I know you do too, Danica. So I have a, um, a question for you that may be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, did you find when you went to the House of Delegates that there was some transphobia in your um, House of Dele Delegates toward you? Well, yes, but um, the, the, you know, so in terms of uncomfortable, oh, geez. I, I, There's no I, such I, thing with Danica. No, <laughs> no, like that part of my soul is calloused over 40 times. <laughs> I know that's part. what I say too. It's like, oh, there's calluses everywhere. Oh, I don't even oh, have what? any nerve endings anymore. I just love telling the kids, you know what the best way to get through it is? Be dead inside. That's <laughs> is a really good way to survive all this stuff. But yeah. no, like I remember, so my um, my first my first session in Richmond, um, it was right toward the end of session. Uh, it was that March. And it was one of those long days where the house is filling, you know, finishing up its conference reports, the Senate's yeah. doing it. And so, you know, you would have 
then Senator Wexton probably sitting at her desk for two hours doing nothing. Me sitting at my desk, you know, the House delegates do another, just kind of, you know, talking to people as they're going by because, you know, just what, you know, just you're just waiting for other people to finish their work as, you know, yeah. sessions winding down. And um, a certain Republican delegate from Loudoun County decides to come over to me and said, asked me to come outside the state capitol for a breath of fresh air. Now, I only did this as an anthropological uh, exercise here and said like, hmm, okay, game on. Uh, I have a feeling I know where, how this is gonna go, but you know, let's, let's, see, let, let's see, I'm curious. So we walk outside the state capitol and he starts asking me about my relationship with God. And you know, God is listening to you. And he's, he wants, and that when you need, and I go, hold on, stop. You do know I spent 13 years in Catholic schools, right? Oh, no, no, I did not know that. Yeah, there's literally nothing you're going to tell me that I haven't heard already. But the really horrific, terrible, transphobic, bigoted comments that you've actually been making about, say, how you think that trans people shouldn't be allowed to teach in kindergarten because it'll scare children, um, that actually does do damage. That actually does hurt people. And the things that you say actually do cause trans kids to find to be terrifying to come out in the first place because they see elected representatives telling them that their mere existence is a flaw, that their mere existence is a lie, and that we won't lie to children by affirming them for who they are. Yeah. You're part of the problem. And just very simply put, never, never lecture a daughter of an Italian Sicilian Bronxite mother because she is look, my ma, her and I agree on three issues of public policy ever. Okay. The last time she voted for a Democrat for president was 1976. And quote, that was a mistake. Okay. <laughs> but at the same time, you grew up in an Italian household, and my Italian congressman, I hope, uh, agrees with this as well. Uh, argument is communication. And I am absolutely on no day of the week going to sit by and idly just go, hmm, this is very interesting, as I'm having someone who has such a bigoted record, try to tell me about who I am. Just get out. <laughs> like, yes. no. Yes. But I will tell you though, I had a lot more problems being a democratic member of the minority party than I did about being a trans woman in the House of Delegates. <laughs> well, <laughs> nicely said. And, and by the way, I think you handled that guy incredibly well. So um, well noted for um, any time in the future that I have a similar situation. I, I'll tell you one quick anecdote about a legislator in my state. And uh, the good news in Illinois is that we have um, a lot of protection for our LGBTQ plus folks. And um, by and large, um, trans folks are, are treated uh, well, there's still obviously um, very concerning things that happen, but we have good laws on and on. But there was this one guy um, who was in the northwest suburbs of uh, Chicago that was a state legislator. Sadly, he was a state legislator for many years, but he did get defeated in the last round. He um, had started trans bathroom bills and had um, these whole things that um, he wanted to write a bill that required schools to treat um, kids that, ha uh, that are trans as if they have a uh, emotional or mental um, health issue. Literally, this is what the bill was around. And so I, this was probably eight years ago, I wrote him a letter every day, an email every day, I called him every day, and I kept saying the same thing. It's like, okay, Tom, his name was Tom, go ahead and I want you to try an exercise so you can help yourself understand this. Try to be the opposite sex of how you feel every single day of your life. Just do it for a week and then try it for a month and then try it for a year and see how your mental health is and um, never responded to me, but I kept it on rinse, wash, wash repeat for almost a year. And <laughs> he got you defeated got last it. time. You're persistent. We love that about you. Good on you. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Well, for, yeah. and for Speaking of ethnicity and, and geography, so it's my um, South Side Irishness that gets me there. So. So for, and for those of you who don't know that that county where that particular state legislator was from in Loudoun County, that's my home county as well. So, uh, so we have some very interesting viewpoints here. Um, and Danica is being too kind because she experienced actually quite a bit of transphobia when she, when she came to Richmond and she's, she's glossing over the thing that I found most offensive, which is that the speaker at that time would not, you know, for, for 200 
300, 400 years, 400 years, they've been referring to people as the gentleman from such and such a place, or or once once they actually had the good sense to start electing women, the gentlewoman from, you know, the gentlewoman from Manassas in her in her case. Well, this particular speaker would not would not would not call her gentlewoman. He refused to. So they just changed that tradition and he would refer to everyone as the delegate from. <laughs> now here, here's a funny side story to that. So obviously he did the right thing for the wrong reason, right? We want to encourage non-binary people to run right. for office. You <laughs> sure. know, it's so, yeah. like, you're like, I was just going to say, that. you're so powerful for creating that change. That's a great. Right. But it, was, <laughs> it wasn't great. done to be charitable toward me. So, right. <laughs> so the the next year, um, one of my bills, I have an agency bill that's up and we're debating, um, <clears throat> sorry about that. We're debating the, uh, one of the governor's amendments to the bill. So this is during veto session. We're really going back and forth on this thing. And one of the members on the Republican side and I are debating over procedure more or less at this point. And even as a freshman, you know, I learned the rules very, very, very quickly. And I, I, I remember to quote from um, former Senator Robert Byrd about, you know, he who, uh, he who knows the rules has the power, right? Like, well, she does too. And so, I'm getting into this like procedural floor fight with, um, you know, one of the senior members on the other side and the speaker of the house is actually having to rule in my favor on this. And he goes to explain to her and he points at me and goes, well, what she's trying to say is that with her bill and she and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just sitting there. It's like, oh, <laughs> and I'm finally. Just like, yeah, finally, right? Pronoun. And then one of my colleagues on my side sends me a text as this is going on and goes, it's a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. That's great. Wonderful. Well, Danica, do you have any suggestions for us about how we can use our platforms and as the transgender equality task force to, to better protect trans kids and trans? Yes. Kids? <laughs> I figured um, you did. <laughs> I, I have, uh, I have a few. So uh, the first on this is it's not the house's fault, it's the Senate's fault. I recognize this, especially like with the Equality Act. I don't have to preach to you all about passing it because you already have. I don't have to preach to you all about, you know, removing the uh, time barrier on the ERA because you already have. These are good things. At the same time, we need the following. Number one, comprehensive non-discrimination and trans health care that is actually codified into US code as opposed to just being an interpretation of HHS. That would be huge. Number two, really reforming the criminal justice system in terms of how trans people are treated from the moment of first interaction with law enforcement until the day they are released from incarceration. The whole system is flawed from the time of that first mention until they get into courtrooms where I had to hear about a case where a, I had, I got a call from Henrico County uh, Commonwealth Attorney Shan, Shan Taylor, who's absolutely wonderful. And she was telling me that she was responsible, her office was responsible for prosecuting um, a trans woman who had been uh, you know, basically accused of sex work. And she, that poor woman was being misgendered and dead named by the judge the whole time. And it got to a point where she was so distraught, she couldn't even get her words out. And they removed one judge and they got another who did the same thing to her. And so just, every step of the system is flawed in terms of how trans women especially, but also trans men are dealt with. And in fact, I had hearing about another case here in Virginia of a trans woman who was incarcerated, who was told she needed to shave her head in order to talk to her girlfriend who was out in Oregon. And if you, as a trans woman, I will say not every trans woman gets to have the luxury of being able to grow out her hair, I do. I'm just, you know, makes up for my nose or something. I don't know. But um, when you're incarcerated and you're looking to cling on to any form of physical femininity that you have to you as trans woman, and that is taken from you and your entire expression at that point in terms of how other people view you is through a masculine lens and there's nothing else that you can do to change that visual perception let alone how you feel in your own skin, it is devastating, absolutely devastating. Your dysphoria will go through the roof. And this is, you know, ICD-10 F64.1 or F64.9. You're talking about people who are dealing with, you know, diagnosed gender dysphoria and 
adolescents and adults. That will lead to you to suicidal ideation for a lot of people, or it will lead to self harm, or it's it's it, the outcomes are not good, and in terms of what happens. And her girlfriend is writing back to me saying, "It's like they've sucked the life out of her." When she would speak to her on the phone, she was just she just had this low, dead tone with no bounce to her voice, no joy. Just they took away happiness from her. And when I checked into this, when we were told, oh, well, PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act at the federal level, uh, this says that, you know, the, no one should be treated, you know, like this. Everything should be going just fine. And we don't understand what the problem is. That's not reality. There are, you know, there's a, you know, one of my favorite books, are, you know, book series and show series that I love is, uh, is Outlander. And uh, there's a line in there uh, in the show from Governor Tryon, who says, there is the law and there's what is done. And that is really the heart and soul of how trans people are dealt with in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. There is the law and there's what is done. And that is a giant flaw that needs to be changed. So healthcare, we're dealing with that. And please, for the love of God, get a federal gay and trans panic defense bill passed because we got done in Virginia. We are piecemealing the state by state right now. But when LGBTQ people are being killed and this defense is being invoked, you're dealing with horrific homicides, horrific acts of brutality. The, the hate crime that is behind it. And yes, we have the James Byrd hate crime rule. I know we got to have elimination of that tactic that is used in court. And it needs to be done at a federal level because right now in Montgomery County in Virginia, where they are examining this latest case, they are trying to figure out basically like, okay, if we bring this into federal court, because you can, you know, basically do this both in state and federal, are they going to be able to invoke transparent defense if we prosecute under hate crimes? Who's to say? They could. They just might, but they won't be able to do that in Virginia because we passed my bill. Our bills matter. So that's that's really what I would just tell you just comprehensively. Um, and, you know, I don't have to tell you all, but just for people watching this, Please make sure your congressman, your member of Congress actually cares about kids and all kids, not just some kids. And kids come in all different sizes, shapes, genders, and every other expression under the sun. No kid deserves to have to go through life in a terrible way, being, you know, stigmatized and singled out because of who they are. Help them. They're kids. Go feed them. That's one of the things I love to do. <laughs> you know, feed all your kids and don't discriminate against them. Let them play sports. Let them feed themselves. Right. That's a good list. Thank you for that list. And we have our marching orders. Yeah. Thank you so much, Danica. That was wonderful. I, I just think that that's a great note to end on because we have our marching orders and, and you have given the rest of the rest of the audience their marching orders as well. Danica, thank you so much. And Representative Wexton, thank you for making this happen. It was fabulous. Yeah, thank you guys so much for helping and everything that we're going to do together. And Danica, it was great to see you. I'll see you around Manassas sometime soon. I'll see you